Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. Today we're going to be talking about spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is the study of, of how light interacts with matter and how light, the interaction of matter with light betrays itself and gets transmitted through space to us so we can receive it. Spectroscopy is simply the way we take the light that's coming from a distant source and use some method by which we can break it apart into a spectrum to see how the intensity of the light varies with wavelength or frequency. So an easy way to think about this is allow normal white light to pass through a prism and then you'll see a rainbow effect. Well, Typically, a rainbow effect is pretty hard to see unless, of course, there's a very narrow opening through which that, that passes the light in a very narrow beam, and that narrow beam then goes through the prism. If it's a general wave of light that goes through it, or an ambient, then the prism will not necessarily be a create a spectrum. Well, it will create a spectrum, but it'll be harder to see. So for us to make it better, we do is you take the source, whatever it is, send it through a narrow slit so that it becomes a ray or a beam. We don't care about losing all that light because we're just going to analyze the light that comes to us from there. We pass it through a prism. The prism breaks apart the light by because the inside of glass, the speed of light is different for different wavelengths, and so it spreads the light apart into its constituent wavelengths or frequencies, and then we take a picture of the incident light on out uh, after it goes through the prism. And that is the study of spectroscopy. Something divides the light up so that we can see the intensity at given wavelengths or frequencies and that we know exactly how that thing is interacting with the light, meaning the prism, so we don't have to worry about the prism's interaction of the light. We just worry about the origin of the source. All right. So if we then look at more common things, like if we take a prism, just a garden household variety prism or a crystal, you notice that there's always a pretty rainbow that comes off of the sunlight. Well, pretty rainbows from the sunlight are indicated here in this image from the McMath Solar Observatory down in Tucson, Arizona, run by NOAO. And this, this, absor this rainbow that we always see has actually some darker spots in it. And those darker spots are the shadows of the slit through which we passed the sunlight. So that's why we call them absorption lines, because we make a, a, we make a line, uh, a, ver a vertical line slit through which we pass the solar, the sunlight, and that sunlight then passes into our spectroscope, and that spectroscope might just simply be a prism, or it might be some other device, like in a shell spectrograph or something like that, or reflecting off of a surface. But at the angle, uh, what we see is we see a series of dark lines on the spectrum, and those are places where it simply is dimmer than the surrounding continuum. So the rainbow itself, we call it the continuum or the continuous spectrum, and there are absorption features which are darker than the surrounding continuum. So the sun's spectrum is actually what we call an absorption spectrum. An absorbed, there is light that's been absorbed from the continuum. All right, so there's a different kind of spectrum as well where there's bright, there's bright emission on top of a dark background. So perhaps the material is not emitting light at all frequencies. Maybe it's emitting light at specific frequencies. And if, those, if the material is emitting it only at specific frequencies, not with a rainbow, but with specific wavelengths of light, then if we pass it through a spectroscope, we see the lines of emission that, uh, that we put here. What's well, funny, we call them lines, and that's simply because when we talk about emission lines or absorption lines, that's simply because we're using a slit type opening. And so we're actually seeing the image of the slit. So in an absorption spectrum, so, or I'm sorry, in an emission spectrum such as these, the emission spectrum themselves, that's the image of the slit through which the light is going. And so you'll see that the image of the slit, the appearance of the line, is the same for each one. It's just the color is different and the wavelength is different. So that's interesting. And we also notice that they're, that they're kind of distinct. Well, emission spectra are fascinating because what you can, where you can get them is if you take, say, uh, sodium, sodium chloride, table salt, and you hold it in a Bunsen burner, and, uh, and you hold it like a bit of table salt in, a, in like a metal, is a piece of metal, and you put it over a Bunsen burner and heat it up till it glows, then the flame that comes off the Bunsen burner will have a particular wavelength. And if you look at the light that is coming off of the burning salt that comes off of there, you get a specific set of wavelengths, and those are emission spectra. 
Now, you'll get a sodium spectrum, and of course, it's, since it's table salt, you'll also get a chlorine spectrum as well. But really, we care about like the sodium spectrum. But you see that a noble gas such as neon will have a different spectrum, and mercury vapor has a different spectrum, and ubiquitous hydrogen throughout the cosmos has, has a spe specific spectrum. So what's funny about all these emission spectra is that it doesn't matter where you get the material from, say hydrogen or helium or neon or sodium chloride or something, or when you get it, or from whom you get it, it doesn't matter. All you have to do is heat it up such that it becomes vaporous and it will emit the same exact emission spectrum. And so therefore, everything has its own fingerprint. Hydrogen has the same thing no matter where you get your hydrogen from. Sodium has the same fingerprint no matter what. And we call these things fingerprints because the emission spectra is at exactly the same wavelengths or frequencies every single time you measure it, which is very interesting which tells you something about the nature of the matter. So what, what emission lines can be done, and specifically we're going to be talking about what, what are called Kirchhoff's laws of spectroscopy. And Kirchhoff, it was, his full name is Gustav Kirchhoff, and in the mid-19th century, he was doing a whole bunch of experimental physics, and he worked with the guy who invented the Bunsen burner, Mr. Bunsen. And they did a bunch of spectroscopy, and what he found were the following three laws. Kirchhoff's laws first say that emission lines are produced at single frequencies of behind, in front of a dark background if you're looking at a hot, rarefied gas that has no bright emission source or no bright continuum behind it. It's just a gas that you see with nothing bright behind it. So you get specific wavelengths appearing at specific uh, brightness at specific wavelengths. And that comes from a hot gas. And that is uh, one of Kirchhoff's laws of spectroscopy. The next one is if you take a continuous source, like a light bulb, like an incandescent light bulb, which gives a black body type of radiation, and that is in front, and that is behind a uh, cool gas. Maybe it's the same gas. Maybe it's hydrogen uh, gas that's cooler than the bulb. Well, as the light from the hot, hot bulb passes through the cooler gas, the cool gas absorbs the light and, it, and the absorption then dims the light at specific frequencies. And those specific frequencies can, where it gets dimmed then get passed through. We see, we see it as a spectrum. And we see something like the solar spectrum. But when we look carefully, we actually see something more interesting, deeper in just a bit. And so we can actually relate Kirchhoff's laws to as a trio of things because a hot, a hot opaque body, such as a light bulb, emits a continuous spectrum. Something hot and opaque emits a continuous spectrum. Something hot and opaque that is behind a cloud of cooler gas, that emits, that, it, that we see if we look through the cooler gas to the hot uh, uh, source, we will see an absorption spectrum. Now, if we look a quarter to that and just look at the gas that did the absorbing of the light, we will see an emission spectrum. So really, Kirchhoff's laws are, th are, two si are three sides of the same situation. You can either look straight at the, continu the, straight at the hot, dense object, and you'll see a continuous object, a continuous source. You'll look at the uh, cloud that's sitting off to the side of the absorption of the hot object and look through the cloud at the hot body, and you'll see an absorption spectrum. Or you'll look off to the side of just the emission, just the hot cloud, that well, cooler cloud compared to the hot body, and you'll see an emission spectrum. So they're all part of the same thing. And that means that as we look at these objects, that the emission lines and the absorption lines are at exactly the same wavelengths. And that makes sense because the let's say it's a hydrogen cloud gas and hydrogen will absorb and emit at exactly the same wavelengths. It's not like it absorbs at one wavelength and emits at another. No, it, it emits at the same exact wavelength that it absorbs. Now, that's interesting. So that's telling you something about the nature of matter, the nature of matter itself. And Gustav Kirchhoff did all the work in spectroscopy well before the advent of quantum mechanics and the model of the, the Bohr model of the atom. So as we look at the nature of what matter is, he didn't know about all this stuff. So he derived these laws empirically, and these observations then had to be accounted for with the advent of quantum mechanics, which they were. So 
Most importantly is that the setup of the spectroscope tells us an enormous amount about the nature of the material. So we can tip, it depends on what you, how you wish to view things or what is possible for you to view. Um, you can set up an experimental apparatus in many, many ways uh, in order to do spectroscopy. But it's typically pretty easy, in well, not easy, typically, uh, it's helpful to start with an emission spectrum in order to identify exactly what material you're looking at. And then hopefully through some chemistry, you can determine really what you're looking at. But spectroscopy itself is considered to be probably one of the most prevalently used science device, uh, scientific tools at our disposal to understand exactly what makes up an app, uh, some kind of object. So Kirchhoff's laws were, were, were developed in the mid-19th uh, early in, in mid century and refined until the early, were not understood of why they behaved until the mid-20th century. Now what can you get out of spectroscopy? Well, the first thing is because every chemical element has its own particular fingerprint or signature, every single element that must be present in there must emit light or absorb light so you can tell the composition of what's in the, what's in the gas that you're absorbing or what the nature of the cool gas in front of the hot body is. In addition, the spectrum changes a little bit if you're looking at ionized gas. So if you ionize a gas, meaning the electron gets blown out of the atom, and if it's blown out of the atom, then the electric field changes a little bit, which changes the spectrum just slightly. And so not only do you have to, to make all these fingerprint catalogs of emission spectrum, but you also have to try to get the emission spectrum of ionized gases as well, which really becomes kind of a pain because the more you ionize a heavy element, the, the, actual, the spectrum itself changes uh, considerably. And then if you then take it, and we we're just talking simple atomic spectra, atomic elements, if molecules are involved, like such as water or carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide or uh, deoxyribonucleic acid or RNA or anything, if you wish to do spectroscopy on complex molecules or even simple molecules, every single molecule has its own individual spectrum and some of them can be incredibly complex. And then we know that that polyaromatic cyclic, polyaromatic cyclic hydrocarbons are actually present in space and can be observed because of their spectrum. In fact, al ethyl alcohol has been found in space and some extraordinarily simple amino acids have been found in space. So this is really interesting. We can know something about the nature of which molecules are present, not even having to go there. It's really fascinating. Now, the other thing that's interesting about the nature of spectroscopy is that because it takes energy in order to, we had a hot, remember we had a hot bulb in front of a cool gas, that hot bulb provides energy into the gas and that gas then reacts to it. Well, if the temperature of the gas is not hot enough, then it might not react or it might not absorb certain, it might not, absorb, might not get the wavelengths of light it needs in, or it doesn't get the energy it needs in order to hop up and down. Or uh, it, we can also then determine that by looking at how the uh, gas is absorbing or emitting at different wavelengths or frequencies, we can actually determine the temperature of that gas. So it, I, if you have a gas full of hydrogen and it's in front, it's above a star, if that gas is above, right above a star, maybe it's the atmosphere of the star, and the atmosphere is cooler than the star, then we might see a big absorption feature for say hydrogen. But let's say the star is extremely, extremely hot and the electrons are ionized off of the hydrogen atom, then you won't get any absorption at all even though hydrogen is present. Or maybe the star is very, very, very cool and you don't get any absorption of hydrogen because the star doesn't have enough energy to kick the electrons out of the lower orbits of, the, of hydrogen into higher orbits. Well, this can also, and spectro so the spectroscopy can tell you something about the temperature of it. If you then look at the nature of the lines themselves, we can find that sometimes the lines are not exactly as narrow as we think. So maybe you, in a laboratory, you measure the frequency of hydrogen, the, the emission lines of hydrogen. And then what you do is you take that hot gas and put it under extraordinary pressure. If it's under extraordinary pressure, you're going to find that the lines themselves, these emission lines, will be broader 
because as it's under pressure, the atoms, the hydrogen atoms are moving at a higher speed, which means that some, uh, some of them are Doppler shifted towards you, away from you, from your emission, which means that as the energy goes into and out of the, the, uh, the energy, uh, as, the, as the atoms of hydrogen are moving fast, as they're emitting, then that can Doppler shift it either towards you or away from you and thus broaden the lines. And that's called pressure broadening. And the same thing happens with density. So if you have a high dense atmosphere, you can get different kinds of broadening. So each of these things can be studied inside of the spectrum of the star and different kinds of broadening or different profiles to the line, meaning not just that the line is like, okay, it's totally uh, dark, and then bink, I've got this one bright thing, like a spike. Maybe it's shaped like a, like a, like a funnel. You know, we have funnel type shapes. Maybe you've got wings and then a funnel. There's all sorts of ways that, this, that matter can interact with light, and the, per, the profile of the line, meaning exactly how does it vary around that particular wavelength, can tell you a lot about the nature of the star itself, or whatever you're looking at. And there's an incredible amount of information that gets carried along with it. And that gives us the physical data about what's happening at the conditions of the matter when the light was emitted. And because now we can understand the elements of such as pressure and density and temperature and composition, now we can do physics. And the physics then allows us to understand what's really going on. And that's what we, that's what, so spectroscopy and the invention of the spectroscope and the, uh, the invention and Gustav's laws as they began introduced the concept of astrophysics to astronomy. Because up until the concept of astro, uh, uh, until the concept of, of spectroscopy really took hold, we could never really know anything about what was going on in the stars. All we could learn is that this thing's moving. It's going across the sky, it's bright, but we didn't really understand the spectrum. So it took some time before we said, well, look, if there must be an absorption spectrum coming from that star, well, stars are very dim, so it took a long time for the technology to come around such that you could actually make a spectrum of a star, photographically at least. But once we understood the nature of the spectrum of a star, we now then could transform astronomy into astrophysics. And that allows us to learn exactly how something is happening, even though it's hundreds of light years away or thousands of light years away or millions of light years away, because we trust that all of the physics that happens here in the laboratory, and this is a really big assumption, this is one of the most important underlying assumptions about all astrophysics due to spectroscopy, is that since all the laws of the physics are the same everywhere in the universe, at all times of the universe's existence, meaning from all the way ago to all the way today, that the laws of physics themselves are the same, then we can trust spectroscopy because we only get a messenger of light. So that's a really interesting assumption that all of light and all of matter is the same here as it was there. And as we measure the laboratory wavelengths of hydrogen, and then we look at some distant quasar, and that distant quasar emits light, and it absorbs light, and there's absorption of light as it travels to us through the intergalactic medium, then we can trust that we can actually understand what's happening between us and the quasar, and even at the quasar that emitted the light, say, 10 billion years ago, and the light traveled for 10 billion years. So, the universality of the laws of physics is what we trust because we've never been to the stars. We probably never will be to the stars. But the physics of light interact with matter allows us to reach with our imagination out to the stars and learn about what is happening over there. And we'll see the effect of spectroscopy everywhere throughout all of these courses. And that's how we actually know what's going on over there. All right. We'll see you next time.